All right. So thank you all for your patience tonight. We've had some very crazy difficulties with the audio and with muting and all kinds of problems that I've never run into before. But it, but it happened, and this is what happens with live TV or live radio, I guess. But anyway, um, I'm glad you've all stuck with us, and I'm glad we're going to be able to uh, uh, show you this entire presentation. Thank you for uh, for sticking with us. So on this presentation, we're going to talk about television. We're going to talk about world television transitions, things that drive technical change. We're going to talk about world digital television standards. And as always, if you have questions, uh, you may enter them into the GoToWebinar interface, and I'll add, or add, answer them to my best of my ability later. So this is a very interesting chart. This is showing the status of the conversion to digital television worldwide. So the countries in red, all the analog signals have been turned off. The transit, the uh, countries in orange, most of the uh, analog signals are off. Um, in yellow, it's just starting, it's in progress. There's broadcasting both simultaneously, analog and digital. Uh, in green, there's no plan or start date, uh, or it's in the early stages. And in, in, in gray, there's no information available. So you can see Asia Pacific is, uh, is, in, is in progress. They're broadcasting in general in both analog and digital signals, with the exception, of course, of Japan and Australia, New Zealand, uh, looks like South Korea, um, Singapore, uh, Malaysia. Those countries are further along and or fully converted. Um, these are the things that drive technical change in the television broadcast industry. The digital television standards, which we're going to talk about, are evolving. Uh, you can see there's also standard evolution. So multiple digital standards, standard evolution. There's always pressure from efficiency, need to have improved efficiency, and the total cost of ownership. And then there's pressure on the transmitter industry from the stand, standpoint of purchase price. So these are the current digital television standards as they exist around the world. And you, as you can see, in Asia, there's at least three standards that have been implemented so far, DVB-T slash DVB-T2, uh, ATSC-3, is our ATSC and ATSC 3 in South Korea, uh, DTMB in, uh, in China, the Chinese digital television standard, and then ISDBT in the Philippines and Japan. So really all this, the television standards are represented in Asia Pacific. And you can see around the world, there's a pretty good mix of all these different standards. So these things do a lot of the same things but they do it differently, and there's no standardization. So as a transmitter manufacturer, there are issues, right? There's difficulties in making sure your system works with whatever system. And even then, even if you've taken and chosen one of those standards, there's additional changes. DVB-T has become DVB-T2 in many countries, not all. And so there's a transition. ATSC in the United States, the digital television standard is going to become ATSC-3. And, and ISDBT, which is the standard for Japan, is evolved to ISDBT and ISDBT-B, the Brazilian standard, which is largely covering Latin America and the Caribbean. So in order to solve some of this, we have to go back to this concept of the Pro Television RF Supercomputer. Remember that the Elenos group of companies consists of four separate companies that were had long storied careers in this industry. One of those companies is Elenos, one is Itelco, one is Broadcast Electronics, and one is Pro Television Technologies, a Danish company from Denmark that manufactures what we call the RF supercomputer. What it is, is a, an all-standards 
universal RF generator that can create any digital television standard. And we were driven to develop that because of the ever-increasing pace of change. The fact that traditional purpose-built hardware just doesn't do it. And we needed a single hardware platform that could do it all. Imagine if you can buy a digital television modulator and hook it into your transmitter, and then the standard changes. You don't have to throw it away. You just put a new program on the RF supercomputer. Let's talk about the history of how this all came to be. The first pro television modulator, well, it's actually a company called Philips back in those days. Uh, they created an analog modulator, which is dedicated hardware, the old normal way of building equipment. And then in 1999, the first digital modulator came out, which had 10 DSPs in parallel. Imagine the heat of that. 2001, a second generation digital modulator, which our own ASIC uh, or ASIC uh, was developed, which was a big jump. And then in 2005, the third generation digital modulator with our own ASIC and FPGA and today's current digital platform is the RF supercomputer. And platform's probably the right word because what happens is we can accommodate all the different standards just by changing the program we feed the RF supercomputer. It's just like a computer. A computer can be very, very powerful, but it doesn't do anything until you give it a program to tell it what to do. And that's what you do with the RF supercomputer is you give it a program to tell it what digital television standard you want to implement, and it does it. So here's the architecture. You have an ARM computer uh, up here, which is a little Linux type of box. You have TIDSP, bare metal, another ARM over here. This one is hard real-time. The one up in the left, upper left-hand corner that I'm pointing to is a hard real-time, which means that the timing is always fixed. That You can count on the timing. It's very specific. The ARM, on the other hand, is running, the second one, is running an embedded Linux kernel. So it takes a little bit different time depending on what instructions it's running. The whole thing is synchronized with GPS, but not just GPS, I'll explain that. But all the worldwide digital standards or timing standards, satellite-based timing standards, are encompassed by this device. And then it has a reference oscillator, which it establishes how long it can operate without a GPS signal. So in other words, how stable is the clock? So we've got TCXOs and we've got all kinds of uh, advanced uh, reference oscillators. Then we have the FPGA, and then we have the analog or digital analog converters first with quadrature mi mixing and a local oscillator. The local oscillator, this, this device will work from 30 megahertz to 900 megahertz. And then it goes out outside the, the card, and that's where the rest of the transmitter is. Everything we think of in the rest of a television transmitter is that high-powered amplifier, HPA. Then here we have a couple of samples coming back into the RF supercomputer. Now, if you heard me talking on the previous presentation hours and hours ago, um, you'll remember that I was talking about how we brought back uh, samples of the linear and nonlinear signals to provide error correction or adaptive pre-correction. So what happens is we bring back a sample at the output of the HPA, and there we're looking for the nonlinear um, uh, errors, so the distortion created in the high power amplifier. That's quadrature mixed with the same local oscillator, goes through an analog to digital converter, and goes back into the FPGA. There, what we do is we create a lookup table. We create an error correction term that has the same amplitude and type as the uh, distortion that has been created, but 180 degrees out of phase. And so therefore, it cancels that distortion and then it goes back out here. So what we're doing is we're creating a feedback network that eliminates the distortion that is created by the HPA. Now, there's also distortion that is created in the channel filter. There's this distortion that exists in the um, uh, group delay, phase, 
and, and the amplitude of the signal. So we bring that back. That's called the linear correction. And that comes back and also creates more uh, correction in a, a lookup table with an inverse of that uh, nonlinearity. And, and it's, it, it automatically cancels out those signals as well. And this is an iterative process. This, this process of adaptive pre-correction is iterative. It, it's constantly sampling the signal and constantly adjusting and optimizing the, the signal. Now, what is this RF supercomputer? Well, if you looked at it, it's a, it's a pretty simple card, about 18 inches long and six inches wide and about, about almost an inch thick, I would guess. But it, 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 there's an awful lot going on there. It's a 16-layer printed circuit board with 2,200 or more electronic components on it. There's five Ethernet ports, each having individual MAC addresses, 100% synchronous design. The radio frequency output, as I said, is from 30 megahertz to 760 megahertz in one hertz steps. The only thing that it requires to, to operate is a, a DC voltage of between 5 and 50 volts. It's regulated on the board. It's firmly remote firmware upgradable. So that means that I can, I can from a distance, I can send signals to this board and change the programming improve it. Maybe there's a bug fix or, or maybe you're changing one system to another system and you want to upload new firmware into the unit. It is a software defined transmitter at the end of the day because it is the the comp composition and the frequency of the signal that comes out the RF is completely defined by the software and the modulation that you provide. So I mentioned that it's not just GPS, it's the whole GNSS suite. So that includes GPS, which is the American standard, and GLONASS, and Galileo, and Bidu, which I believe is a Chinese standard. And it you can pick any one of those two. Uh, if you're, for instance, in an area which is served by both sets of satellites, and it will seamlessly switch among those to get the best timing information. There's built-in web server in this um, in this system of, for monitoring and control configuration. There's no Flash or Java involved in that web server. It's uh, extremely powerful. There's three different levels of reference oscillator. That's what I was talking about with holdover duration being the differentiator between them. Um, and all the systems that it currently supports, DVB-T, T, H, or T2, ATSC Legacy, that's the current ATSC, ATSC3, ISDBT, or the Brazilian alternative with Remux, Analog PAL, Analog PAL Television, or NTSC, DAB, TDMB, DAB+, DRM, the VHF version, and HD Radio. So these, all these technologies are, are, either fully implemented or soon to be fully implemented in the in this card and for the television purposes it's all for fully implemented one of the things that Atelco stands for is high efficiency for low cost and long life and one of the things that's happened over the last few 10 10 years perhaps is that digital television power amplifiers transmitters have been inherently low efficiency because of the linearity that was needed. Digital television it consists of thousands of individual carriers, and in order to have those carriers all coexist without creating a, a complete mess of frequencies of intermodula intermodulational products, you need to have incredible linearity. But over the last 10 years, typical AC to RF efficiencies have improved significantly. Uh, back over 10 years ago, you know, 15, 20, 25% efficiency was pretty good. Now we're doing far, far better than that. One of the things that has changed to make that happen is Dougherty topology. Dougherty is an amplifier technology, and it's well known. It Most people used this or ran into it first in AM transmitters. But basically what happens is you've got the modulated amplifier for the bulk of the signal, but every once in a while, you get these peaks that are much more than the, 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 that one amplifier can run. 
and the Dougherty amplifier kicks in and powers those peaks. So Dougherty technology, and it's evolving too. There's all kinds of new, uh, new developments in Dougherty technology, but has been employed to achieve the highest RF efficiency because you don't turn on the most high power amplifier until you really need it just for that instance. There's also high efficiency power supplies, power supplies that um, are, are virtually 100% efficient. I, I, not really, but they're, they're greater than 90% efficient. And adaptive, advanced adaptive pre-correction, careful design of the RF path to reduce losses, uh, low power consumption cooling system, reduction of the heat dissipation, and thus increasing the overall life. One of the things I mentioned in an earlier part of the webinar was something called metal migration, which exists in solid state devices. Metal migration is a predictable um, influx of the metal where the, the metal is a, uh, actually put onto the silicon dye. And as, it, as the dye is hotter, that occurs faster and it poisons this, this transistor and the transistor will eventually fail. It's very predictable. It's not unlike a filament failing in a tube. But the key thing here is that the t for every 10 degrees approximately Celsius cooler, you keep the silicon dye, the, the life doubles. So that's a, just a rough rule of thumb, but the cooler you keep the solid state devices, the longer the life of the device will be. And of course, savings of operating costs due to the high efficiency. So high efficiency helps you twice. It helps you because it reduces the cost of electricity, which is a big cost in high power television transmitters. And it reduces the heat generated, which you also have to exhaust some fashion. But by reducing the heat, you also improve the long life of the transmitter. So current efficiencies these days, uh, AC, or DC to RF are about 45%. If you include everything, including the filter and the power supplies and the cooling and the whole nine yards, 36% is typical for broadband UHF 474 to 690. If you break it into two bands, you can get up to 50% DC to RF, which works out to about 38% at the output of the transmitter. So that's not quite as broadband, not covering the whole UHF band. This is so much better than it was in the years past. Telco has a full range of television transmitters. The MEX series covers VHF and UHF up to five watts. It's basically a standalone exciter. It's air-cooled. The IEC series is a UHF only product up to 200 watts. It has an integrated exciter for low cost. The Alpan series is VHF and UHF from 25 watts to 600 watts. It's air-cooled, and the modules are hot-pluggable, both the RF modules and the power supplies. The Thalna series is VHF or UHF, 600 watts to 2.4 kilowatts, air-cooled, again, hot-pluggable. The Northia series is VHF and UHF, Two and a half kilowatts to 10 kilowatts. It's liquid cooled, again, hot pluggable. And then there's the IoT technology for super high power from UHF from 60 kilowatts to 300 kilowatts, liquid cooled only, and very, very high power. Here's a little video showing the inside of one of the transmitters and the liquid cooling system. Very short, by the way. This is showing the redundancy in the cooling system. These valves are changing the direction of the water flow to maximize the efficiency and effectiveness. Okay. And at Telco, we also specialize in custom configurations. So we have 
the ability to build n plus one transmitter systems, one plus one, all manners of, of custom configurations. As you can imagine, large television stations uh, often need a custom solution, and that's what we do at Atelco. So, Atelco is a company you can trust. There's more than a thousand high and medium power TV transmitters still in service since 1985. Innovation drives the whole company, the whole LNOS group, but Atelco particularly has always been a pioneer in the broadcasting industry. We return 10% of our revenue into R&D, research and development, and we're customer oriented. The state-of-the-art turnkey projects are tailored to specific requirements. We're always working to maximize power efficiency, to save money and help you pay back your transmitter, minimize the cost of living or cost of operation. Um, lifetime costs, low cost of maintenance, no additional costs for switch off from analog to digital. Think about that. The fact that you're starting with an, an exciter, which is forward compatible, we can upgrade that in the future as another te television standard or improvements to the standard come out. We support what we, or we stand what we, behind what we sell, we support what we make, and we're future-proof because all of our transmitters are based on the RF supercomputer, so you won't be left behind as standards evolve. We're one strong company. All the products are made by the Elenos group of companies, Elenos, Atelco, Broadcast Electronics, and Pro Television Technologies. It's time for your questions. We know we haven't had any questions all night long. I'm wondering if Aside from the audio problems we were facing earlier, we we're also running into problems with the uh, with the questions uh, situation. Um, feel free to email me if you've had questions for any of our uh, presenters tonight. Uh, email me at c kelly that's c k e l l y at b d c a s t dot com. That's c kelly at b d c a s t dot com. As always, we know how valuable your time is. We're honored that you chose to spend your day with us. Please check out our upcoming webinar schedule at www.elenosgroup.com forward slash webinar. And for further information, contact Mr. Frank Massa, the Asia Pacific Group Sales Manager in Thailand, f.massa at elenos.com.